Well, and and just read and pray. Let's, let's we encourage you to go into uh, prayer here. We're we're speaking. In this psalm, this is a kind of meditation. I'm speaking to myself. I'm talking to myself about the benefits of God. But this is a kind of prayer as I meditate. So, uh, but I like this the King James Version, but uh, we'll also look at the New International. So would you uh, just go through this with us? Pray the whole psalm. Be glad to. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not his benefits, all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He has made his ways known unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with, dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, as far as, so far has he removed his, our transgressions from us. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass as the flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it and is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandment, to do them. The Lord hath prepared him his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless you, the Lord, all ye hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all of his works in the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Okay. Man. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> this is a favorite psalm of mine. It's also, a f I think, the favorite psalm of my father. And... Uh, uh, in the King James Version, uh, the speaker is addressing himself. You know, we, we have internal dialogues. We talk to ourselves, right? Especially <laughs> and, uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, we, we, but we always do that. That's, that's what we call self-consciousness. We're conscious of ourselves. We speak to ourselves. Uh, one of the problems of people who are, who are depressed is that they tend to get down on themselves. Uh, and, and in fact, we always, we, sometimes we have a tendency to do that. For, for, for example, um, uh, I remember playing golf with a guy who, you know, he's a duffer like I am, like most of us weekend golfers are. Uh, and, and he would often Hit a, hit a ball the wrong direction, and he would say, John, you're stupid. You can't do anything right. And uh, every time he would hit the ball and it wouldn't go exactly where he wanted it to go, he would he would condemn himself. <laughs> and I, I said to him, John, I said, stop condemning yourself. God, stop talking to yourself that way. You're, it only makes your game worse. <laughs> It's like the basketball player who has to shoot that free throw at the end of the game who says, you know, I'm no good. 
I'm sure I'm going to miss. <laughs> well, <laughs> he's more than likely to miss if he condemns himself. So we we do talk to ourselves, and sometimes uh, we get down on ourselves. Uh, it, but on the other hand, uh, we can get too up on ourselves. We can get too high and mighty, and we're told in the book of Romans not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But here, <clears throat> the the uh, we are talking to ourselves about the Lord and about specifically his benefits. And uh, the New International Version uses the word praise, but uh, the King James has the word bless. So we are blessing the Lord. We say to ourselves, bless the Lord, O my soul, in the sense of, of praying to him. Now, Reardon uh, describes this way of praying to God, this way of prayer where we are meditating inwardly as a third way of understanding scripture. The first way of understanding scripture is the historical or literal meaning uh, that these certain things happen historically or literally this is what the uh, scripture is saying. Uh, the second way to understand scripture is, is to understand scripture is in some sense always referring to, pointing to, are being fulfilled in Christ himself. And as Christians, uh, we read the entire scripture as being focused upon Christ, even the Old Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, even the, the Hebrews when they were in the wilderness, uh, the, when they uh, they drank from the water there in the wilderness, he says they, they were actually being filled with uh, Christ himself, and the bread they drank, they ate, the ate, the manna was from Christ himself who was feeding them. All of these things pointed to Christ and were fulfilled in Christ. That's the second way of understanding Scripture. But the third way is to understand Scripture as referring to ourselves. If we are in Christ, then everything in Scripture can be interpreted uh, as referring to ourselves. Uh, and then I have a, a paragraph, which I thought was worth quoting, and I'll just read that from Reardon, which talks about this way of, of understanding Scripture. Uh, when you pray, wrote St. Jerome, and he goes back to the church fathers for this understanding of Scripture. When you pray, you speak to the bridegroom. And when you read the Bible, he speaks to you. There's a dialogue in our prayer. This scripture is speaking to us. The reading of Holy Scripture is a privileged locus of the Christian's dialogue with the Lord. For the soul in Christ, the Bible is preeminently the book of the heart, where we study our own history. We come to know our own identities. We come to know who we are through what we read in Scripture. Who are we? What is our true identity? This third sense of Scripture corresponds to what Bernard of Clairvaux meant when he called the Bible the book of experience. <clears throat> we don't really correctly interpret the Bible. The, the Bible is a book which really interprets us. We do not even understand ourselves until the Scripture gives us the true meaning of who we are. And, and this way of praying is a way of reflecting and meditating upon who we are and and what we have in Christ, who we are in Christ, and more specifically in this psalm, the benefits of being in Christ, the benefits of God's mercy for us. And so in this prayer, we're, stri we're striving not to not forget, but rather take into our souls, as he says, um, uh, and I'm, I'm quoting from the New International Version. Praise the Lord, O my soul, verse 2, and forget not all his benefits. We're speaking to ourselves, reminding ourselves, do not forget his benefits. And then he goes on to, re, to recount these benefits and to meditate upon them 
and to bless God for them. Uh, thus, our soul blesses God in the sense of praising and honoring him for all his benefits. And, and that's kind of how I've organized uh, the, our, um, our discussion of the psalm in, in the sense of the, the benefits that are specifically laid out here as, as the soul reflects upon them. Um, and um, at, uh, at the beginning, the, all the benefits of God ultimately flow from the very character of God where the psalmist says later, not uh, down in the psalm, that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Or as the King James Version, I think uses the word mercy every time the New International has love. Right. And um, the word in the Hebrew really has both meanings, uh, love and mercy. Uh, and uh, the, <clears throat> the benefits of God flow from his character, who God is. Uh, the New Testament says, you know, John says, God is love. Just like <laughs> the, the, the sun is light. The sun cannot help but throw light, shed light upon the earth, even though we're 93 million miles away. Uh, God is love. He cannot help but be merciful and loving. That is, that is his very character. And um, there are several metaphors here that fill out the meaning of his grace and compassion or his love. First of all, uh, there is the metaphor that we are, we are dust. He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. No more substantial than grass. Psalm 78. Is, recounts Israel's history of faithlessness and disobedience. Over and over again uh, in that psalm, the psalmist recounts how Israel uh, disobeyed God, first of all, building a golden calf, and then uh, complaining in the wilderness, refusing to go into the promised land, worshiping various idols after they entered the promised land. Over and over they rebelled. Um, but God's anger was restrained, according to the psalmist. He was restrained because he remembered that they were but flesh. Part of God's compassion is uh, to understand that, is to see that he realizes our frailties. Um, or to go on to point number two, it's, it's, it's a, we can understand it like a father who looks with mercy on the failures, mistakes, the stumbling, and the outright disobedience of a child. That uh, how, how hard is it to forgive your children? Now, as adults, we find it very hard to forgive people who mistreat us, who uh, cheat us, who betray us. But how hard is it to forgive your child? And those of us who are parents, which I guess includes most of us, you can remember times when your children have, have just uh, been disobedient or plain stupid. I was reading a, a book recently by an author who had a farm up in Minnesota, and his uh, child, nine-year-old child, uh, ended up playing with a lighter in the barn. And they uh, caught the hay on fire and burned the barn down. Oh, my. Uh, and, uh, of course, the child had been warned, you don't, <laughs> you don't play with a lighter in the barn around a bale of hay. But uh, uh, how long did it take the father to forgive the child? Of uh, burning his barn down. Not very long. Mm. Uh, because... Children are like that, aren't they? Children are like that. And we are like that. And he has, God has mercy on us like a father with a child who is just so irresponsible. Um, 
And uh, uh, the third thing that could be pointed out here about God's mercy and anger, well, there's really four things. One point I, I, I kind of miss here uh, is the fact that, that he is slow to anger. Um, he does get angry, but he is slow to anger. That's not the first impulse God has towards us. But uh, and in connection with that is how he abounds in love. The the wild, profligate outpouring of God's love uh, that Paul talks about in Ephesians. Uh, and I, I like to just read the, these three verses: Ephesians one seven, and chapter two, verse four, and verse seven, uh, where, where Paul is describing what. The, the benefits of Christ's redemption we have through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished upon us. It's not that God is gracious, that he's kind and merciful, but he is rich in grace, um, which he lavishes upon us. And in chapter 2 and verse 7, or verse 4, it talks about God, who is rich in mercy. The mercy is not just uh, uh, there in some limited amount, but ri rich. And uh, the same word is used in verse 7, that, uh, he, that he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness toward us in Christ. The incomparable riches. Uh, that's illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son. Some people have said <clears throat> it might better be called the parable of the prodigal father, because what does prodigal mean? Hmm. What does what does prodigal mean? Why don't we call the the this son prodigal? Hmm. You need to, you have a dictionary in front of you. Yeah, my phone. I do. Hey Siri, what does prodigal mean? As an adjective, it means spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant. Do you Wasteful. want to hear the next one? Did you get that? Wastefully extravagant. Yeah. Mostly I want to help and have interesting conversations. <laughs> you can be quiet now. <laughs> But part of Sorry. it is that wastefully extravagant, isn't it? <laughs> wastefully extravagant. You know, like, when yeah. the son comes back, when the son comes back, the father doesn't say, well, uh, we're, it's glad to have you home. Go in and uh, uh, get yourself cleaned up and uh, we'll, we'll welcome you back. Oh, no, he, he doesn't just say glad to have you back. He doesn't just accept him. He throws a big party for him. Wildly extravagant. Puts the robe on him, the ring on his finger. Right? It gives him this place of honor. He doesn't just accept him. He lifts him up and honors him as if he is really, really special. And, of course, the elder brother is, is quite disgusted at that wildly extravagant mercy, you know, shown to him. But uh, that's the prodigal father, isn't it? That's the worst thing God shows us because we're not deserving. None of us are deserving. No, it doesn't have anything to do with, the, with our deserving it. It grows out of his rich grace, the, the riches of his grace. How rich is God? How wealthy is God? Well, you know, that, I think the difference, though, uh, Bob, I think the difference is that the, the, son's, the son's extravagance was wasteful. Okay, it, it, it brought no, no value, but the father's extravagance is not wasteful. The father's extravagance is establishing or reestablishing the relationship with with the son. And that's the kind of extravagance the Lord has for us. It's not a wasteful extravagance because he's redeeming us. There's value to God's extravagance as opposed to 
in this case, the prodigal son's strategy. Uh, yeah, of course. Of course, there's a big difference between the son and the father. The, the son was extravagant in, in the sense of sin. The father was extravagant in the sense of mercy towards the sinner. So there's a big difference. But, um, and then uh, among the benefits of God, uh, among the benefits of his uh, rich grace and mercy and his abounding love, is he forgives our sins. That's the first thing he mentions. As he says, uh, as he meditates, do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins? The first, the first point. Um, and this is the basis, uh, or the foundation for all the uh, benefits that we enjoy. Because... Um, until God forgives our sins, we're not fit to receive anything else or to enjoy any kind of relationship with God. He has to clean us up, and but he does clean us up. He forgives, and we become sinless, righteous as Jesus himself. Even though our sins are as scarlet, Isaiah says, he washes them white as snow. And, uh, and we're confident as uh, he will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. This is the fundamental, the most fundamental of the benefits of God's mercy. How far gone are our sins? Well, where are they now? They've been removed as far as the east is from the west. Um, and... And as far as our sins, God even has amnesia, Isaiah says, uh, in a metaphorical sense. Isaiah 42, 43, 25, he no longer remembers them. Isn't that interesting? No longer remembers them. Once the curse of sin has been removed, the way is open for all the consequences of sin to be reversed. But the sin has to be removed. There must be forgiveness before the consequences of sin can be reversed in our lives. And then he immediately goes on to recount these benefits. He heals all your diseases. Now this is the, the, the uh, redeemed, forgiven person. This is, this is you and I speaking to ourselves. Uh, he re heals all your diseases. I'm speaking to my soul. How does God heal our diseases? Well, there are three ways, aren't there? Through the mechanisms built into our bodies by nature. There are natural healing mechanisms. Uh, I have, a, you know, at my age, I, I, I got so much sun when I was young. And, and as you age, your skin naturally gets thinner. And I can just... And I rub up against a door jam, and I'll tear a piece of skin off. <laughs> but um, it repairs itself. Um, I don't have to go and get surgery or have any kind of medicine. It just repairs itself naturally. Um, and uh, when I get a bad cold, um, you know, there's no medicine that will cure cold anyway. Uh, but uh, our, the body heals itself. We have those mechanisms built in. The, uh, the, the T cells and the lymphocytes that attack infections. And uh, the second way is, of course, that there are ultimate, uh, there is uh, unique, miraculous interventions uh, that go beyond anything built into our bodies by nature. But miraculous healing does occur but those are those are not often not everybody is healed miraculously and um, a lot of times we pray for people who are sick we pray for either for the some healing that uh, we understand we, we're praying either for the body to heal itself or some, some natural healing to occur through 
the uh, science of medicine, or we are praying for God to intervene. But the person many times or ultimately dies, right? So has God failed to answer our prayer? Is this, is this a denial of the verse, he heals all your diseases? I remember uh, a Lutheran preacher I heard one time say that when we pray for healing of someone who is sick, God's answer is always yes. He always heals. Either by number one or number two, or by number three, through the resurrection of the body. In other words, this prayer for healing is always answered. He does heal all our diseases. Just so he may not heal them how we on earth want him to heal them. Because yeah. we, we'll miss these people that die. So, but that's, that's life and death. Philippians 3.21 says, God will transform our lowly bodies that are sick, lowly and sick and corruptible, so that they will be like his glorious body, which is totally healed and not subject to death or disease. And the third ultimate benefit, then, he, he redeems your life from the pit. Because the penalty of sin no, uh, no longer rests upon us. Our bodily infirmities, even death, no longer rules the race of the new Adam. The, uh, the, uh, there's very little said about the resurrection of the dead in the Old Testament. Uh, and there are verses, even the Psalms, that kind of seem to indicate that that uh, the grave is the end. That once you die, you're in the you're in Sheol. But there are these intimations uh, in places like this that indicate that there is a hope for the resurrection because he says he redeemed your life from the pit. He's talking about the grave. So for those of us who are in Christ, we will enjoy the resurrection of the dead and the, and the remaking of our bodies like that of the Lord himself. Um, point number five, he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. What kind of benefit is there in, in God making his ways known to us? Well, if God had not made known his ways to us, what would we know about God? We might know there is a God. In, in fact, we should be able to determine that there is a God through the things that have been made, Paul says. At least his power and divinity. There is, a, there is a divine supreme being, and he must be very, very powerful to have made the universe. The universe is not self-explanatory. Mm. But what, 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 what good is that knowledge? Um, well, I think in this instance, it says, I mean, God explaining to Moses who he is, you know, in that relationship. Because what they're referring to there is, is an Exodus 34, 6 through 7, where, where Moses is on the mount, mountain and God's passing before him. And he says, he, he proclaims, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. So he's telling Moses who he is, his character that way. It's like a, it's his, he's speaking his own word, you know, or, or who he is. It's a promise. But he has to reveal that. Otherwise, we would not know it, would we? By our own reasoning. Well, and, and it's funny because <laughs> later on in that story, Moses quotes it back, to him, <coughs> quotes it back to God. <laughs> when God wants to wipe them all out, Moses says, oh, remember, you told me 
that you are slow to anger and founding mm. yeah. faithfulness yeah. and God um, relents, you know, in some of those situations. And he also reveals himself through through his deeds. He made him, his ways known to Moses and his deeds. It's through God, what God did for his people that tells them something about him, doesn't it? It's what God has done for us that tells us who he is. And that's how you, you really know who, who another human being is. You don't know them simply through what they, the way they talk. You know them through the way they act, right? How does this person act? What are his deeds? That's who he really. That's who we really are. If I may say something, um, well, as far as the creation of the universe and of Earth, you know, in the Bible, how you can remember in Scripture how it will say he made the foundations and the cornerstones of the Earth, and uh, well, now, now in science. Science has become so advanced that we do know now that the Earth has uh, has continents. The continents are basically floating over the surface of the Earth, you know, floating all around. So that we have Earth, you know, when we have earthquakes, you know, it's all part of God making the Earth, you know. And so the, um, I mean, those the people back then. And ancient times didn't know any of that, how the how the universe was made, how the earth would set the cornerstones and foundations of itself. And God set all that into motion. Yeah, science uh, does show us uh, the wondrous wisdom of God more and more. In fact, uh, uh, what science is in some ways is really trying to understand the mind of God in terms of his creative power. Uh, right. Point number six, uh, we've already talked about uh, God's love and compassion, but there is this word he crowns us. <laughs> he crowns us. Uh, uh, this is this is our everyday experience, a life crowned with the love and compassion of our Father in heaven. How great is this love, as high as the heavens are above the earth. And, and point number seven, I think, expands upon that. He crowns us with love and compassion and satisfies, and, and of course, this is the soul speaking to itself. It, he uses the second person speaking to himself. He satisfies your desire with good things. Uh, and he, he, he expands on that. He makes grass grow for the cattle. Well, in Psalm 104, I'm quoting Psalm 104. How does he satisfy us? He makes grass grow for cattle, plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. He satisfies us with all of these good things. Every time we sit down to eat, how, Im how important to recognize that those good things that come from the earth are part of God's way of blessing us and satisfying us with all of these good things that the food that we have and the shelter we have. And um, point number eight, your youth then is renewed like eagles. That's a reminder, it seems to me, of the promise in Isaiah 40. You remember these wonderful two verses people we've often memorized where the God promises his people, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The benefits of God are to renew our strength uh, physically. But, but in some sense, uh, we talk about people who seem to, to never grow old. How is that? How can a person who's like myself, 86 years old, not grow old? 
or 90 or 100. How do you do that, Bob? <laughs> What's your secret? <laughs> well, if you already have eternal life, you're not growing old, right? Do you have eternal life now? Yes. Yeah. We do, don't we? That, the free gift of God is eternal life. That's a gift that we already have. And so our youth is renewed. There's a constant renewal. We're constantly young, forever young, because of the gift of eternal life, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That is part of the, these benefits that the soul meditates upon. Point number nine, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. There's a special benefit for those who are suffering, particularly those who are suffering oppression and justice. And, uh, and, and that's revealed most particularly when he delivered the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery. They cried out to God in, in their misery, uh, the way Pharaoh was treating them as his slaves, and he delivered them. The... Um, uh, uh, the African Americans, blacks in our country under slavery, uh, look to God as one who delivers them, who offers them uh, deliverance from oppression. Psalm 58 5 says, He is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. Some people say the Bible teaches God helps those who help themselves. They actually, it's and that's really the opposite. God helps those who are helpless. God helps those who cannot help themselves, who are truly in a situation of bondage. Now, it's, now it's also true that if you have the ability to get out of bed, God is not going to perform a miracle and snatch you out of bed. <laughs> he's, going to, he's going to let you get out of bed and walk under the power he's already given you, right? But for those who are powerless, those who are oppressed, there is this promise of God for their care. Those who don't have a father, the widow who doesn't have a husband to defend her, to provide. One of the benefits of God, especially for those who are suffering oppression and injustice, and uh, finally, number 10, the, the last point I, I see in this psalm is uh, that uh, there is no limit in terms of time or eternity. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. That he is eternally faithful to his covenant promises to those who believe in and fear him. I think uh, um, Paul, um, in one of the letters to Timothy, or is it to Titus, uh, Paul says, even if we are faithless, even if we are faithless to God, he remains faithful. He will not deny his own promises. He will be faithful to the promises he's made. A wonderful way to meditate on all the benefits of God whom we bless and praise for all these benefits but they're not based in some vague sympathy that God has for pure sinners it's these benefits are based upon a definite costly work God had to do something these benefits don't flow just out of his sympathy, but they flow from something that cost him, the death of Christ, his own son. And so this prayer, our prayer closes with a declaration of the universal reign of God who bestows these benefits. The Lord, this Lord, who, who has... Uh, bestowed upon us and blesses us with all these wonderful benefits 
has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. So this is a, a good time to pray. Um, there are two, um, this is a wonderful political prayer. We're in a political season. There's a, here's a wonderful political prayer. Thy kingdom comes. Since his kingdom has been established, we continue to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we bless the Lord, ruler of heaven and earth, and rejoice in the multitude of benefits he bestows. This, this way of, of meditating upon and talking to ourselves about the grace of God uh, is rooted in our personal experience of the indwelling spirit. Because Paul says in Galatians 4, because we are sons, God adopts us into his family. And, and the way we understand and the way we experience his grace and mercy is through the Spirit of God, which is, and, and has been poured into our hearts. The Spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. It's through the indwelling Spirit that we, we know, we experience deep in our own hearts that God is that compassionate Father who pities us like a father pities his children and who is rich in mercy and abounding in love. Well, uh, if, um, if I ever get discouraged or I'm beginning to feel down, uh, I like to go to this psalm and just meditate on the benefits and bless the Lord for them. Any comments from you guys or to add anything, add to this? I think it's awesome. You did great. Do any of you have a favorite song you would like to look at? I'm thinking, Brent, maybe we'll continue through until the, uh, the, well, the, the Friday before Thanksgiving. And then maybe take a break through the, the first of the year. Sounds good. Uh, but that gives us what? How many more Fridays? Um, Today's uh, the 30th. Yeah. Just three? Yeah, that'd be three more. The, the 6th, the 13th, and the 20th. Mm, right. Well, I'll put that out there. If anyone has a favorite song to get in touch with you. Uh, Brent, you and I will be gone on the 13th. That's a good point. Okay. You know, as I, I read through this, um, the Christ in the Psalms, this book by Reardon, he's a, he's a Greek Orthodox priest. And um, I'm just uh, amazed that he talks about how um, I'm, I'm trying to change my view here. Well, I need to stop the sharing here, don't I? Hey, Mike. Mike, can you hear me? Yes. You drive. What's the company that you work for now? You drive for? It's wheelchair transport. Wheelchair transport. 
Okay. I thought it was Care Driver or something or Care that's Ride. The, that's the other one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are, are, do you know if they're hiring? I I don't know. I ha I've been laid off for seven months. Oh my gosh! So mm. I guess not. Probably not. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, did you get? How are you doing there, Mike? Is it must be pretty tough times, huh? No, not at all. I've uh, I'm on unemployment, and that's enough to almost get me there. And then I've been doing some odd jobs on the side, so I've been just fine. Okay. God's provided. Yeah. God is provided. Well, thank God. Yeah. Mike's handy. He, he yeah. can do things. Yeah. I like, like to fix things. Right. Maybe not like doing roofs anymore because, uh, you no. know, you're, you're over 40 now. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I think about that roof we did for that single mom back yeah. then, and it was like, there's no way I could do that now. I know. Me it seems like it seems just like yesterday, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I spent the last uh, five months working on that house. Oh, you, oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, I depleted her savings account. So <laughs> gotta take a break. <laughs> well, uh, are there? Um, um, burdens on your heart we can pray with you about anybody what's going on in your lives that you're concerned about really ought to pray for uh, the outcome of this election no matter what it is of course uh, God is in charge we need to pray you know um, for God's kingdom to come not not the um, the conservatives kingdom or the liberals kingdom but god's kingdom we need to pray that regardless of how the selection turns out that the people don't resort to violence you know those who don't get an outcome that they want that, that yes. they don't resort to violence and destruction and yes with that yeah, and say, Good providence of that. I hope hope we don't. But I think either way, either way it goes, we'll have violence. We can have. We could have violence. Well, um, uh, I can pull this up right quick here. Second Timothy two. Well, let me just read it out of the scripture here. What that says about how we should pray. Um, oh no, it's not Second Timothy. What is it? Is it First Timothy? Yeah, I urge that uh, requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. And then he's first two. He says specifically for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceable, peaceable, and quiet lives. So uh, he specifically asks us to pray for kings and those in authority that we may live peaceable and quiet lives in all godliness. So um, let us let us pray for that. Certainly, uh, may, maybe the violence is inevitable, but uh, I don't. God can do wonderful things, and He can restrain people. Uh, and and actually, of course, government has been ordained actually to restrain evil doers, according to Romans thirteen. That's one of the main main purposes of government. Any other re other request? Yeah, I'd like to lift up uh, Dave Inslow today. He's the, you guys know him from, he's the head of Next Steps for Men, and he runs the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference. Dave has 
has moved recently, an opportunity in his denomination or whatever has come up, so he's moved closer to his kids or family in somewhere in South Carolina. Oh, I, see. I, I think, okay. yeah. He he told me he couldn't tell me where it was at because I'd want to move there. Uh, <laughs> so he, he he's kind of moving to heaven, according to him. Um, but unfortunately, Dave uh, ran into some health issues recently, and some weird stuff was happening to him. He was losing weight, and uh, and forgive me if I've already told you guys. I know I've told Sal about this, but I can't remember if I shared it with uh, with Friday morning guys. But pray for him because he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Oh, has he? Yeah. Oh, man. He, he's, he's not a, he, he said he was a smoker in his younger years, but, you know, hasn't for, you know, for many years. But yeah. so he's, he's uh, got a battle before him. So just pray for him that, that there's a... Uh, pray for that healing. Yeah. He's on my thoughts this morning because he just, he would, he loves this kind of thing. You know, guys getting together and reading the word and sharing our lives and stuff. That's what, that's what he does 24 seven. So I'm going to send him an email after we got done here let him know that band of brothers loves him and is praying for him. Okay. Um, I might ask you to pray for um, a fellow who's painting my house now. It's kind of a handyman. And um, he, he stepped on a piece of glass walking in his yard barefoot and, and he's he's not been able to work much and it's infected uh, he's a veteran and he's having trouble getting the treatment he needs um and um, i'm really concerned about him his his name is monty m-o-n-t-e i think he's a believer but he doesn't really have a church connection so um ask you to pray for monty's healing and of body and spirit Brent, would you lead us in prayer then and close our session and lift sure, these Bob. concerns to God? Yeah. Father, uh, I just thank you again for this morning for crowning us um, every day. Uh, even though we are undeserving, uh, it is your nature. It is who you are. Your love and compassion and mercy just flow so freely Um out of you and, and on to us. And, and we thank you for that. We thank your son that was willing to bridge that gap between our sin and your holiness. And uh, may we not just uh, soak that up just for ourselves, but may we share that with others and may we reflect it to others that uh, others may know you as well and, uh, and come to the Father. We want to lift up Dave Inslow and uh, his battle that's before him, his change of address now, and, and just uh, comfort and be with him. I know that you will surround him with a, uh, with a, a good um, group of people up there that will just love on him. Um, we just lift him up for healing. And we also pray for Monty that uh, has cut his foot. We just pray that he will get the care that he needs and, uh, and that uh, you'll just open that window of, opportunity between him and doc that uh, they may have conversations that would you know help him spiritually as well on that path we pray for our country uh, we know that you love us you know you love the united states we're not perfect far from it uh, just let folks know that this is uh, just part of our history and know that you are god and that uh, you will be there regardless of the outcome um, and we pray in your holy name amen Amen.